How's everybody doing today? Yeah? It's so nice out. I, I come from Abbotsford, right? And so it's always like kind of cloudy, or when it's hot, it's really hot. Um, but it's so nice out. And you get to see the stars here. Um, just to give a quick context, I am Caleb. I'm actually in my fifth year of Bible college. Um, I'm taking the same program that Jordan, uh, Uncle Clint's um, son, took. And uh, yeah, I'm John and Laurel's son. Um, yeah, when I was preparing for this sermon, I had a couple like, I was going through texts that I thought had impacted me or are really special to me or have, have stayed in my mind. And I was contemplating, I was contemplating Philemon. I've preached from Philemon before. And then I was like, oh, I could do Jonah too. And it wasn't until I was preparing for this sermon that I was like, oh, there's a really common thing going on there. And that's that both deal with grace, but particularly grace that's rooted in God's character and how that is uncomfortable for even those who follow God. And so I've preached on Philemon. So we're going to do Jonah, Jonah 3.10 to 4.11. And that's a good chunk of scripture. That's 12 verses. Um, but I think that's where the real meat and potatoes of the of the theology of the book actually are. Um, and so we'll do a recap, we'll read the text, we'll pray, and then we'll start going through it. So we'll just do a little synopsis of the story up to that point. Um, right in the very beginning, it opens up, God calls, he commissions Jonah to go, hey, you should go, go to Nineveh, their sin has made, I'm aware of their sin, and it can either, you can either actually be rendered, it's uh, preach against them, for, they, for I know their sin, or preach against them, because... I concern, I'm concerned about their sin, which this will become a theme going through, God's concern. Um, obviously, Jonah, we've all heard the story, doesn't go. He'd rather go, to, he'd rather go to Tarshish, which could be Spain, which is like the furthest known area away. Um, so he obviously goes, he goes west when he's supposed to go east. Um, you know, storm, God throws a storm at him and... Uh, Sailors all freak out. They pray to their gods, doesn't do anything. So then he's like, fine. They drew the straws. He's like, fine, it's me. You got to throw me overboard, which is funny because then it would mean that if he jumps himself uh, in the Torah, that would be a bad thing. But if they're thrown over, it means that they murdered him. So Jonah's a little bit of a coward even still. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, he's thrown into, this, thrown into the sea. There's a bunch of st stuff you can read in there. But uh, God preserves his life in the belly of a fish. He's then vomited up on the, on the shore. Presumably, he does all these things that he's promised to do in chapter 2, where there's like this, his prayer to God, give me, be compassionate to me. Like, save me, oh God. Um, and then God recommissions him. This time he goes, when he does actually arrive in Nineveh, he doesn't preach a message of like, hey, God's going to wipe you out in 40 days, or you should repent. He's just a message of dread. Hey, God's going to kill you, so um, there's that. So even still, he has his own little, he really likes to mess with God's commission. Um, unlike when Jonah experiences the mercy of God, he is very upset when he, God expresses giving mercy to other people. Um, despite this, the king hears it, the king of Nineveh, and here you'll, you'll notice I'll actually do a thing here where I'll switch Nineveh and Assyria. They're the same. Nineveh's just the city. Of, it's not the capital of the Assyrian Empire. It's actually more like their cultural and economic capital. And so the king of Assyria mentioned, or king of Nineveh mentioned in Jonah could just be the ruler of Nineveh rather than the emperor of the Assyrian Empire. It's a little weird tidbit for you. Um, the king orders a citywide fast, begins to mourn, and throws everything he has on the hope of a chance of the mercy of God, and it's right there where the text takes off. Um, so let's get started. We'll read the text, pray, and get going. So, uh, Jonah 3.10 to 4.11. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God relented from the disaster that he had prepared for them, and he did not, uh, and he did not do it. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to God and said, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I, when I was yet in my own country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are gracious and merciful, slow in anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me. It is better for me to die than to live. 
And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah then went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat in it under the shade till he, uh, till he should see what could become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it to come up over Jonah, and he made shade for his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came the next day, God appointed a worm to attack the plant. It withered. The sun rose. God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die, and saying, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry about the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And God said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor make it grow, which came into being in one night and perished in another. Should I not also pity for Nineveh, that great city, in which there are 120,000 persons who do not know their left hand from their right, and also much cattle? Dear God, I, I, I thank you for the opportunity that we have to look at your word. I pray that my thoughts just go one in one ear and out the other. But what you prepared for people to hear, that you help them receive. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, so, 310. Nineveh repents, God relents, and Jonah gets angry. Um, I don't want to bore you with the Hebrew in this passage. Okay, so, like, I, I had to cut out so much, because there's so many, like, cool little Hebrew things going on throughout this entire passage, but I don't want to have you all fall asleep. So, skipping all the legwork of the Hebrew, um, the city's fuming, uh, he's fuming over the city's deliverance, something that he judges as very evil, or in Hebrew, gadol, ba, uh, gadol ra. Um, however, this is the only time that the book uses the adjective gadol, or great, large, very, big thing, um, in conjunction with a moral term. Um, it's... it's Interesting because Jonah uses that idea of great and large a lot. It uses it as a poetic device. And this is the only time that it's used in connection with a moral term. And so it's like he uses this word often, and then this is the point where it becomes important. Um, again, skipping all the legwork, tongue-in-cheek, it would seem as though Jonah is more upset with Nineveh's deliverance, he considers it very evil, in that moment than God actually is considering the evil of their sin. Jonah says, oh, their deliverance is very evil, where at the beginning God was their evil. Again, we're getting the tongue-in-cheek there. Jonah thus finds Nineveh's deliverance worse than the divine judgment that had threatened its existence. This all comes bubbling up in uh, 4.2, where Jonah's motivations and emotions just boil over in his prayer to God, and thus cuts right to the heart of the problem. Jonah reveals that right from the beginning, he knew that God was sending him on a mercy mission. He knew that God is gracious, that God is merciful, slow to anger, abounding steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. Jonah does not seem to have a problem with divine mercy. He actually kind of acts expecting it. He has an issue with how God distributes it. Thus, to Jonah, God's clemency is a source of unbearable offense. Such a scale of offense concludes Jonah in his prayer that he would be better off to be dead than alive. Um, a little excursus here. Jonah's listing of God's divine characteristics appears to be rooted in Exodus 34. <laughs> um, so, for those of us who know that, that story, it's when they... The Israelites build the golden calf. God's like, ah, I'm going to wipe them all out. And Jonah steps in and goes, hey, um, maybe um, you're a loving and gracious God. Um, please don't do that. And God doesn't. And it's in that moment where the Israelites, through that story, learn that he is a loving and gracious God. So Jonah, being an Israelite, knows that God is loving, gracious, kind, we're not wanting to pour out disaster and wrath. It's at this point where some of us can kind of lose sight with the original context. Jonah is an Israelite in the 7th century BC. Um, he's seen the type of horrors that the Assyrians do. Um, and the Assyrian Empire has gone through nation after nation after nation, and now they're on the doorstep of Israel. 
He knows this. Um, just to give a little bit of context, I'm actually, it's actually better that the kids left. Um, some of the atrocities that the Assyrians would do would be they would, uh, they would fillet you and display your skin on the city walls. They would force you to grind up the bones of your parents into dust. Um, no, I don't want to go anymore. <laughs> I was going to go further and then be like, you know what, if you really want to know, understand the context, you have to see these are really bad people. Um, if you really want to see them, to, to read about it, it's interesting, but it shows why Jonah is angry. These people make Rome look tame. Rome, which could crucify, had crucified tens of thousands of people in a day. Because in comparison, Rome was civilized. Assyrians were evil, evil people. And they were an unstoppable empire, and they're on the border of Israel. Not only that, it's safe to conclude that Jonah has heard the messages of Hosea and Amos, where, where they're like, hey, Israel, if you don't change your ways, God is going to use the Assyrians to come in and execute judgment on you. It's, it's weird then, if that's the context, why people will go, hey, Jonah, you, you know second chances are good. Jonah, just ha have some forgiveness, buddy. That's not really what's being taught here. It's not about second chances. These are the worst people Jonah knows. And God's, hey, I'm, I'm concerned about them. Like the, the closest thing that we have, the closest caliber of evil that we have to this day would either be Russia and Ukraine or China with the Uyghur Muslims, which we just don't talk about in the West for weird reasons. Keeping that in mind then, it might, keeping that context in mind, it might help us understand where this text is going. Um, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself now, so let's go back to the text. Um, regardless, Jonah is deeply angered by God's relationship and actions with the workings of the world and would rather not partake in it at all. Jonah prefers death as opposed to serving a patient and forgiving Yahweh, a God who refuses to limit his grace to just Israel. He does not wish to live in a world where Israel's enemies are absolved by Israel's own God. For Jonah, this new perspective of God breaks his views of justice and arguably of even God himself. Uh, jo God in 4.4 then responds with his rhetorical question, meant to draw Jonah into a personal reflection and dialogue, but Jonah just refuses to answer. And there'll be more on this later when God asks it a second time. Uh, verse 5 explicitly states that Jonah leaves the city. Most commentators then to think that he goes to leave the city. He watches it to go, you know what, maybe God's still going to destroy him anyway. Doesn't happen. He builds his little hut because, you know, it's hot and you're in the middle of the desert and it's uncomfortable. Builds his little hut, right, to keep himself protected. God allows, God has a, a object lesson in mind because everybody loves object lessons specifically when they're the, uh, they're the one learning the lesson. So he builds his hut. God causes the plant to grow. And this causes Jonah exceedingly, exceedingly glad joy. This is great. He's shaded. It's good. He's not uncomfortable. The author, again, is being intentional with that word, gadol, great, big, exceeding, big thing. Jonah is glad about a little more shade on his head when he is enraged about God's mercy and disappointment. His, his hope for a destroyed Nineveh still remains. Yet God's purpose for the plant extends far beyond Jonah's comfort. So in 4.8 then. No, oh, I picked up two pages. No, it's just not there. Cool, I'll go from memory. <laughs> um, God appoints a worm to go then eat the plant to destroy the plant, right? The plant goes down, and uh, God then appoints a great scorching east wind, and he blows it right at Jonah. And then the, the, the sun beats down, and it's just making him die, right? Like, he's just faint. He's brought to the edge. Uh, Jonah then reiterates at that point that it's like, hey, it's better for me to die than to live. Being a little dramatic now. <laughs> 
the, this reiteration of Jonah's words are meant to at least help the reader for us to understand that the coming uh, reiteration of God's same question is meant to tie the two, aden- uh, two events, Jonah's anger and discomfort over the p- destroyed plant and Jonah's anger and discomfort over the saving of Nineveh. Um, and in 9.8, these two things come to a head. Or not 9.8, 9, uh, sorry, 4.9. Uh, scholars disagree entirely with the relationship between those two things. Um, but God's reiteration of the question um, is clear, and we'll get exactly why. There's probably a rather simplistic way to view that. God's question, do you do well or do you do good to be angry? Um, the Hebrew in this can mean that. There's no problem with that. In fact, in modern English translations, that's exactly how it goes. Um, there is a compl- there is a alternative rendering, which, again, there's no reason why you wouldn't think that in the Hebrew. It all depends on how you view the uh, heteb stem. It doesn't matter. The other rendering of it, which is favored in other modern languages, is it, and if it's put in a very southern way. It would be, are you good and angered up? Or is your anger that intense? Um, There's a reason why that rendering appears to be taking over. Because it matches Jonah's answer the second time the question's asked. Jonah go, God goes, hey, are you really that intense? And Jonah's response is, yes, I'm that, yes, I'm that angry. Angry enough I can die. What that question reveals about uh, God is he's not looking for a fight with Jonah. He's like, hey, are you good to be that angry? Are you doing a good thing? He's not looking to create moral fight over, God, over Jonah's anger. He's not even harshly rebuking him as God does in Job. God rather seems to sympathize with Jonah's despair and even probably wishes to, re- to relieve his pain. God's question reveals that he is still slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and has compassion even for his unfaithful, embittered, and broken prophet. So God asks the question again, is your anger that intense? But this time, Jonah responds. Jonah emphatically doubles down on his anger, effectively saying, my anger is so intense, I could die. The word for anger here, it's another interesting, weird thing in Hebrew, is the exact same as to become hot. And so there's some weird wordplay going on there, especially with God's like, oh, you're hot, are you? Is the sun beating down? Or are you angry? Oh, okay. Jonah's anger with the plant is at least pseudo-justified. There's this uh, assumption in Jonah that God will continue to be compassionate, will continue to be loving, kindness, have loving and be kind. Um, however, by God destroying the plant, He gives him that unmitigated justice that Jonah has wanted for Nineveh. The capricious change in God's actions was contrary to Jonah's own, just Jonah's list of God's attributes in 4.2 and properly provokes Jonah's anger. The implication will soon become apparent. So in 4.10 and 11, it's no small thing that God's rebuke of Jonah when he's like, actually, let's just, we've talked a lot about the text, let's just read 10 and 11. So Jonah says in 9, I am this angry. I'm angry enough. I wish I was dead. God responds. The object lesson has come to its full flourishing. It's learning time. But God says, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend to it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And you should not, and should I not be concerned for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot know their right, who do not know their right hand from their left and many animals? It's no small thing that God's rebuke to Jonah is a call to compassion or concern. In fact, all the emotions that Jonah had toward the sun, the wind, and the plants are all aspects of concern. Likewise, the various emotions God felt towards the city can be summarized in the statement that he had concern for it. In fact, that goes all the way back to Jonah's first commissioning in chapter 1. To put bluntly, 
God is to Nineveh what Jonah is to the plant. But one is a plant, which Jonah did not labor over, did not cause to grow, only benefited from, while the other is a great city full of ignorant people who don't have, like Jonah and the Israelites, they're not in a covenant with God. They don't know their right hand from their left. It's interesting that then God tacks on, and the animals. The, God's main question to Jonah is a rhetorical one. Should I not have pity for Nineveh? The main, question, the, the main theme and driving factor of the book is brought up here and stands beside Jonah's listing of divine characteristics, which happened multiple times throughout it. Jonah obviously knows them. He lists them. He acts assuming them. He acts in, in the very belly of the fish that, he's, that God will continue to be compassionate, continue to be kind, continue to, be, continue to relent from disaster. In effect, God asks Jonah what kind of God he thinks he should be. There are only two real options then. Either God is a compassionate, is it God, God is compassionate, giving mercy to Nineveh, Israel, and Jonah, or ruthlessly just not even acknowledging attempts of repentance or protection. And there's a connection between Jonah's inadequate hut, because he builds his hut and he's still really, it's still really hot on him, right? He still needs God to grow the plant to then give him necessary shade or adequate shade. Just as, is, just as Nineveh, they, 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 they tried to do their small little bit of repentance, but that's not enough. That's never been enough. As Christians, we know that it's, it's by Christ's sacrifice, not our repentance. And so there's even a connection there. The theology behind the work becomes clear then. Jonah's compassion, God's compassion leads him, to become, leads him to perform gracious acts. And he will not be restricted in that exercise by anyone's narrow theological understandings. Nineveh was not spared because of her effective repentance any more than Jonah was shaded by his ineffective booth. But both the sparing of the city and the shading of Jonah are acts of God's compassion. After making this point, the book just ends because it's not concerned about Jonah. It's, what it does is it forces the question on the reader to contemplate. Like Jonah, people must come to terms with God being gracious, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster towards all people. Especially when it doesn't benefit us, fit our desires, or even our concept of justice. So there's, main, there's, four, main, there's four, more, four main takeaways here. One, God will give grace and have mercy to people, and we may want to vehemently protest. We must, be, we must come to terms with how God acts and recognize that we may not always, in the moment, agree with his dealings. Actually, it's in the inverse of Abraham. So when, uh, when God is about to destroy Sodom, Abraham goes and he's like, hey, is there, is there ten righteous people there? Um, and he concludes, in the end, after dialoguing and interceding on behalf of Sodom, that he concludes in Genesis 18, 22, 18, 33, actually. Um, Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And then he swallows God's decision uncompromisingly. In the inverse, we must do the same. If God is going to give grace to these people, okay, he's the Lord of all the earth, and he will do what's just. That's the first point. God will give grace and mercy to people, and we might want to vehemently protest. Second point, because I can't get rid of Philemon, because I really like the New Testament book of Philemon. Um, we are called, and in Philemon we're actually ordered to, give grace and mercy to, uh, to others ourselves, even when we, do not, we may not desire to do so, or even have the legal right to pursue justice. Um, just a quick synopsis of Philemon um, on Onesimus, Philemon's slave, runs away, steals stuff, runs away, meets Paul, becomes a Christian. Paul's like, hey, um, you're a Christian. You stole stuff. You're, you have to make things right. So he sends the epistle, or the, the letter of Philemon with Onesimus back to Philemon. And in it, he's like, hey, um, I understand that he was your slave, and then he ran away. And in Rome, you had the legal right to kill that person. Anything that he stole, this is what Paul says, anything that he stole, I'll pay it. 
I want you to embrace him as a brother in Christ, though. Difficult. Because in Roman culture, it would be, that would be ludicrous. It would be unheard of. But that's what God's love, mercy, and grace does to his people. Third point. God's grace, mercy, and compassion are not to be abused. Anybody that's read the minor prophets in the Old Testament um, while trying to keep a historical framework of what's going on, which is harder than it sounds, will know that uh, only a generation or two generations after Jonah, um, the book of uh, Nahum takes place. And uh, it's all about how, like, hey, Assyria, you may have repented once, but you reverted right back. And I think my favorite line, something to the effect, in chapter 1 of Nineveh is, uh, not Nineveh, in, of Nahum is something to the effect of the Lord doesn't have to strike twice. Once is sufficient. He makes, he levels Nineveh. By the time of Nahum, God's patience and compassion has run dry and they have reverted back to their old ways. Paul actually urges that same point of don't abuse God's grace in Romans 2.4, where he argues that the purpose of God's kindness and patience is, to, is meant to bring about repentance, but those who, fail to build, to, those who fail to repent actually build up the wrath of God for a later date. In short, be thankful for the mercy and grace of God today, but never cease in our repentance, assuming the kindness of God. And point four, all of this is done in and through godly compassion. Comparable and synonymous with uh, the New Testament's foundational idea of love, compassion in Jonah, is what allows us and Jonah to accept God's mercy to the undeserving, give grace to those who have wronged us, and appropriately, appropriately worship and act in motivational repentance. It's important to notice that these challenges are going to apply on a personal level, and on a global, international scale. Jonah's message, then, should stand as an intensely personal challenge. The book wrestles one down, paints one into a corner, and forces them to, ask, to answer the last question of God in chapter 411. Should I not be compassionate to Nineveh? There will be I'm sure people can think of any time in the last, let's say, just year where someone is, someone in or out, in the church or outside of the church has done something horrendous. And we're talking really, really horrendous. We can, like, I can give examples of, like, you know, like someone's ripped you off or someone did, someone, you know, lied and ruined your, wi your life or something like that, right? But the text here actually with the Syrians goes wild, Right? Because the Assyrians are really bad people. If a person then, or let's say just with COVID, you know, they come up all into your face and they want to pick that fight and you're just like, oh, whatever. And then they go away and they continue to have their good relationship with God. And you're like, come on. They were not just mean, but they were vindictive, divisive. If God's going to have grace on those people, are you going to get all uppity about it? Are you going to sit on the side and watch, waiting for God to just... Because it might, we might want that. Because admittedly, if you put yourself in Jonah's shoes, yeah, I would not want my home country to be invaded by the Assyrians. No. Instead... We are challenged by the compassion of God and invited into viewing the world as he does. In effect, when we understand and we try to embody the compassion of God, it's what causes us to have the same, understand his acts of mercy. Compassion is the, the cause of Jonah's anger, and it's the answer to Jonah's anger. It's the answer to how the modern Christian can overcome the uncomfortable relationship with God and his scandalous acts of unmerited mercy. 
In the New Testament, actually, this, this might be a little bit of actually a tangent. In the New Testament, God ups the ante, um, like most things in the New Testament. Um, in Jonah, God's grace is predicated on their repentance. And yet, in the New Testament, what do you have with Christ on the cross and Stephen who's being stoned? Uh, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. And Stephen's, hey, forgive them. They just don't hold this against them. And then you have even Jesus. Hey, if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. But that's it's a little off of this point. We'll, get, we'll bring it back in to that idea of uncomfortable grace. The, the best New Testament example of this I would actually be the older son in the prodigal son story. The prodigal son, you know, he goes off, squanders all his money, blah, 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 comes back, and this, the dad's like, awesome! My son's returned. He was dead, now he's alive, right? And the older son's like, come on. I was here the whole time. You're going to throw a party for him? I've, I've been the faithful servant. What's going on? And what's the father's response? I, he's your brother. He's back. Have, have compassion. Come on. And there's more instances of that all throughout the biblical text. So I'm going to pray. And then I hope that what we can do is we can go from here and we'll be able to pinpoint those instances in our lives where people have wronged us and God has not held it against them. There's that final page. <laughs> Dear God, I ask that you, you teach, continue to teach all of us that your grace is rooted in your character and constantly I struggle with it. It's easy when it's ourselves. It's easy when it's people we love. But when it's people that, are, that we don't think deserve it, despite the fact that it's all of us that don't deserve it, we question it. And yes, vengeance is yours. And you are judge. But I have to teach me and continue to teach us that you are compassionate that you are kind, that you are loving, and that you are relenting from disaster. And that your character spans all across the Bible, both new and old, and nothing, and it's not new, you're still loving. In Christ's name, amen.